We at the Menzies Centre look forward to all of you joining the conversation about Britain's and Australia's shared future, which we will continue to host here at King's. Please visit our website for details of how you can get involved. And I also invite you to talk to myself or colleagues if you have any questions about how you can financially support the work of the centre and indeed of this marvellous college. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage the President and Principal of King's College London, Professor Ed Byrne, who will introduce His Excellency, Mr Alexander Downing. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Ian Henderson. Uh, look, can I congratulate, can I start by congratulating you, Ian, uh, John Douth, uh, the advisory board of the Menzies Centre, many of whom are here, uh, for the way this centre has really come on uh, over the last year or two. Uh, this centre was established uh, by the Howard government uh, as a key centre for Australian studies in Europe. Uh, and it's, uh, I think it's fair to say that it had a, uh, an idea perhaps uh, maybe five or six years ago uh, but in recent times, very strong links have been established with many of the major Australian universities, uh, led by the University of Melbourne uh, under Glyn Davis's leadership. So it's particularly special uh, to have the Vice-Chancellor-elect, uh, Duncan Maskell and Mrs Maskell, here tonight. Welcome. The Menzies Centre is uh, a pivotal uh, aspect of Australian-UK uh, university relations, especially in the humanities and social sciences. And an absolute champion for the Menzies Centre has been the current High Commissioner, Alexander Downer. Uh, Alexander is very much a man who understands both countries. Uh, uh, he spent some of his youth uh, in the UK, uh, although quintessentially Australian. Uh, he, um, his father was High Commissioner here. Uh, and uh, Alexander went on to be one of Australia's most successful foreign ministers with an incredibly long term of office uh, and is really responsible for uh, many of the brilliant uh, relationships Australia has uh, with countries in its own region, especially in Asia, but in the world more broadly. Uh, there's no better leader, really, uh, for the Australian High Commission today with the myriad op of opportunities uh, in a post-Brexit Britain uh, to strengthen the relationships between the UK and Australia in so many different areas. Uh, I know from personal experience that the High Commissioner has been leading thinking in that regard, uh, and I'm looking forward immensely to the topic of his lecture tonight, uh, Australia and a post-Brexit Britain. Please welcome uh, the Australian High Commissioner, His Excellency, the Honourable Alexander Downer. Thanks very much, Ed, for that uh, introduction. And John Douth, the uh, chairman of the Menzies Centre Advisory Board, Ian Henderson, who is the director of the Menzies Centre, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, let me begin by saying how honoured I am to be the latest in a long list of very distinguished lecturers to give this Menzies lecture. Um, there are a lot of reasons why I'm delighted to do it. One is to be in the company of great people such as Zelman Cowan, who gave the first. I know John Howard, our former Prime Minister, gave a Menzies lecture as well, and many other distinguished lecturers. But also, I'm very happy to do it in the memory of Sir Robert Menzies, because Sir Robert Menzies um, was one of those people who was a great friend of my father's. And Ed referred to the fact that my father was the High Commissioner here. It was Menzies who asked my father if he'd like to be the High Commissioner here, um, an offer that my father took up with alacrity. And given the friendship between Menzies and my father, Sir Robert Menzies used to come to our house from time to time. Um, very politically incorrect by modern standards, at least in one respect, and only in the one respect, don't you worry, um, in one respect, and that is that he would sit in the living room of our house and smoke huge Cuban cigars. I don't think the Cuban bit was incorrect in Australia. We're not the United States. Um, but the fact that the whole house was enveloped with cigar smoke was something that we pretended to enjoy and were disgusted with. But 
I remember him in so many ways. Um, particularly, I remember him fondly as a child. I have three sisters. And Menzies, whenever he came around to our house, um, would spend time, even though he was this grand prime minister, and he was a big man in every way, um, he would spend time talking to us and asking about our schooling, what subjects did we enjoy at school. Um, and then, being the intellectual that he was, he was able to um, talk with, 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 with such uh, fluency about these subjects. Well, we were not intellectuals, we were just children. We had no idea what he was talking about, but you know, I said I was doing sort of second year Latin at school, and then he would quote a lot of Latin to you, sort of slightly lost. Um, but he was a man who showed a great interest in young people and helping young people and advancing young people. And I think of the many qualities that you sometimes find in humanity, that's a very nice one to come across. So I remember Sir Robert Menzies as a person with great affection. And for that reason, that reason alone, I'm very delighted to be giving this lecture in his honour. So Menzies is discussed a lot in the context of Australian foreign policy, and there are different interpretations um, of what may have been in his mind as Australia charted its way through the world in all those long 16 years that he was the continuous 16 years that he was the Prime Minister of Australia. But I suppose what lay at the heart of Menzies' approach to foreign policy was the notion of the national interest. Um, so although often it's said that he was very emotional towards Great Britain, I'm British to my bootstraps, and quotes like that often used, the one he used about the Queen when she visited Australia, I did but see her passing by. Um, these are often used um, to try to paint a picture of a Menzies who was beguiled by Britain, um, who was so emotionally committed to Britain and to the relationship with Great Britain, that he couldn't see past that to more specifically Australia's national interest. I actually think he was a man who was de very deeply focused on Australia's national interest. So, for example, when he was first the Prime Minister in the late 30s up until August 1941, he spent some time over here in London um, working with Churchill and the War Cabinet at that time and his relationship with them was actually not a very happy relationship, as is often recalled. And it wasn't very happy because he didn't think that the British government was uh, showing enough concern for developments in Southeast Asia and North Asia and the threats that these could cause to Australia. So it's not surprising um, that um, Sir Robert Menzies said in 1939 what Great Britain calls the Far East is to us the near north. Now this isn't a man who was just focused on relations with Britain or was British to his bootstraps. These are the comments of a man who first and foremost was focused on Australia's national interest. Um, and this, I think, um, was demonstrated in spades during his period as Prime Minister. So why would have he focused so much on Britain in the 1950s. Well, Britain ran part of, uh, um, well, up until 1948, ran a very, with a bit of an interruption, I've forgotten to mention the Japanese, um, but a, a bit of an interruption there. But Britain ran a great chunk of Asia. Um, and in terms of Australia's near neighbours, well, for example, what is now Malaysia and Singapore were British colonies at that time, up until the late 1950s. Um, in Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies were the Dutch colony until well, 1947 or 1949, whichever you choose as your, your starting point, but certainly formally and finally recognised as an independent country in 1949. Um, so during that period for Australia, relations with The Hague um, were about relationships with our, in, with our immediate neighbourhood. And of course there was the there were the French colonies in Indochina coming to the end that they came to with Dien Bien Phu. So for a statesman in Australia in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, these relationships with the so-called metropolitan powers, with the colonial powers, were very crucial relationships in terms of our own neighbourhood. But even so, as Menzies saw, to use Harold Macmillan's phrase, 
the winds of change, um, the process of decolonization passing through. As Menzies saw all of that happen, um, his government's policies showed a flexibility um, of, uh, uh, of securing Australia's national interests in particular, but not exclusively, its security interests. He um, was the mastermind of the ANZUS Alliance in 1951. The Australian government under Menzies promoted um, the Colombo Plan, which a lot of you in, um, who, who are familiar with Australian universities will know a great deal about. It was the Menzies government that concluded the 1957 Australia-Japan Commerce Agreement, which was the first major regional trade agreement that Australia ever concluded. Um, so, so, so Menzies realised the winds of change were taking place. Whether he felt emotionally happy or unhappy about it, he recognised what was happening. He directed Australian policy towards a new approach to its own region, to the Asia-Pacific region, um, and as a result, um, Australia has been able to build on that quite comfortably. Um, through all of this, um, we saw um, changes taking place here as well, which led to a sub substantial transformation in what uh, you might here call the Anglo-Australian relationship. High Commissioner here, and he was High Commissioner for a very long time, by the way, a period I don't uh, wish to emulate. He was High Commissioner here for eight years. I see some journalists here, perhaps they could take a note of that. It won't be eight years. Um, um, I wouldn't be married for very long if I told my wife I was going to be here for eight years as High Commissioner. But, um, but um, my father was the High Commissioner for eight years between 1964 and 1972. And this was a period of very substantial change in the bilateral relationship. And for him, and for many in his generation, was a very a period of sad change in the bilateral relationship. So although the process of decolonisation inevitably made Britain and the other colonial powers, uh, France and the Netherlands in particular, much less important to, well, somewhat less important to Australia, um, still, Britain was hugely important to Australia in all sorts of ways when in 1964 my father replaced Sir Eric Harrison as the High Commissioner here. But there were events that led to a substantial transformation of that relationship, for good or for bad, for what they were wise or unwise. That's a, that's a debate for those of you who are British to reflect on. That's not for us and certainly not for me as a High Commissioner. Um, I think the first one I'd identify um, was the decision by the Wilson government to so-called withdraw from east of Suez in 1968. And the withdrawal from east of Suez seems um, it's anachronistic to talk about it today, but it was very controversial in Australia at the time. The Australian government, although it had the ANZUS alliance with the United States, it was uh, um, continuing to consolidate that crucial centrepiece of Australian security policy, which it still is. Nevertheless, the, um, the relationship with Britain's role in our security in, um, uh, in Southeast Asia um, was something very much valued. So when the British government decided for essentially economic reasons that it could no longer afford to maintain forces east of Suez, this was greeted with some dismay and disappointment by the Australian government. Then um, add to that, um, um, uh, in 1971, um, the British government made a series of changes to its immigration policy. Um, and uh, those changes had quite a psychological effect on Australians, where Australians had prior to then been able to come over here to the United Kingdom and um, move uh, seamlessly into living here in the UK without the complexities of visas and different grades of visas and expensive applications for visas. Um, the, um, the fact is um, that all changed. Um, you understand that debate. And we don't offer any particular view about it, but at the time, a lot of people in Australia were very disappointed. There was a kind of view that, hang on, um, we had been fighting for the British Empire, for Britain in two world wars. We sent troops over here. We had people in everything from the Battle of Britain as fighter pilots to bomber command. And we had soldiers in, the, in, in North Africa, two of my uncles fought there. 
Um, we, um, and then, of course, the, in the war in, against the Japanese, people like my father felt very passionately about all that we had done. My father was a prisoner of war of the Japanese for three and a half years. And um, so uh, along comes a British government for reasons which I think you would regard as intellectually entirely defensible, um, but saying that this free access to the United Kingdom isn't going to continue. Um, as somebody said to me yesterday, imagine uh, um, Sir Robert Menzies having to queue in the others queue coming <laughs> over here to the, exactly, uh, coming over here to the United Kingdom. It's a slightly shocking thought, isn't it? Um, but there you are, that is what he'd have to do. And those of you who are Australians know what a happy queue that is. <laughs> it's getting better, by the way, if there's anyone here from the British government, it's getting better. Um, so, um, um, and I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, so, and then finally, Britain decided um, to join the European Union. Um, and so that uh, act of joining the European Union took place at the beginning of 1973. At that time, the UK was our third largest export market and our second largest source of imports. Um, so it was a huge trading partner. Um, and there's no doubt that this did do quite a lot of damage to our exports. Um, so sudden moves like that can have a substantial impact and um, uh, it, it, it came at a time when a lot of other things were happening to our economy and the global economy which were none too helpful. But nevertheless, um, in 1973 the Australian co economy, particularly farmers, were um, wounded by Britain's um, accession to the EEC and thereby, thereby joining the common agricultural policy and as a result, we not only lost markets, but as time went on, the surpluses that the common agricultural policy then generated were dumped onto global markets, reducing global prices. So this caused quite a considerable degree of anger um, and wasn't very helpful, if I could put it that way, um, to the bilateral relationship. And I mean, that's sort of, um, let's face it, that's um, entirely inevitable. So uh, I think it's fair to say um, by the time my father finished here uh, in 19, October 1972, so just a few months, all the deal was done by then, and just a few months before uh, Britain actually formally joined the EEC, as it was then called, he felt that his mission here had been a sorry mission, um, that from the time he came to the time he left, the relationship had slid somewhat backwards. Um, now, you can argue that that was... Um, uh, the right thing for Britain to do. Um, you can argue, as people did, but people like Geoffrey Rippon, the then Minister for Europe, argued furiously with my father, um, you're a mature and successful country and you can go and find markets elsewhere um, and you need to chart your course in other parts of the world. In a sense, that was right, we did, um, and we've been very successful in pursuing those policies. I think um, what happened then was um, what you might politely call a relatively quiet period in the bilateral relationship. And I often quote this to people, and it's, it's I think, um, worth thinking about, actually. Um, there was no visit to Australia by a British Foreign Secretary for 17 consecutive years up until 2011. Now, you can say, uh, well, um, British Prime Ministers very occasionally visited. Um, I remember um, John Prescott, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister at the time, coming to Australia. I remember Geoffrey Howe on another occasion coming to Australia. Um, you know, um, Michael Portillo as the Defence Secretary coming on one occasion. Uh, what is interesting is, though, having been the Foreign Minister of Australia myself for very nearly 12 years, during that time, my British counterpart never visited Australia, never came. Now, I say that wasn't everything. Our bilateral relationship had great strengths, and I'll come on to that. It did have great strengths through that period, um, but it is, was, is a simple illustration that at best, when it came to um, relations with Australia, the relationship with Australia was seen as not worthy of sending the Foreign Secretary. Um, and that is quite something. And then in 2011, William Hague was the Foreign Secretary in, I think, January 2011. 
John Douth will remember when it was exactly, because I guess he was the High Commissioner at the time, uh, so he should take a good deal of credit for this. Uh, William Haig came to Australia um, for the Australia-UK ministerial meeting in that year. Um, and foreign secretaries have been on a regular basis um, since that time. So that is something we now put behind us. Um, so um, what does this all tell you? This all tells you that here is a relationship once so strong, once such a central part of Australia's place in the world, um, a relationship which faded um, and a relationship which it brings us up to an analysis of, of now. Now, there are several things I would say after three and a half years as the High Commissioner and quite a few years as the Foreign Minister before that about the relationship that we have um, with the UK. The first um, thing to say is uh, that the strongest component of our relationship, and of course it always has been since British settlement of Australia in 1788, the strongest component of that relationship is the people-to-people -people links. Um, and I must say, I think the, um, the statistics, not always very, a very interesting part of a lecture, but the statistics are ver very illustrative of how important that people-to-people -people relationship um, is. Um, there um, are more British-born people living in Australia than in any other country in the world, other than Britain itself, of course. Um, there are actually, um, for those of you focused on the Brexit issue, and there are probably very few people here ever think about it, but <laughs> those of you... I know, when you go out here, people talk of nothing else. Um, the, um, it's all right, I'll get to it. Um, <laughs> for those, the, those of you interested in that issue, and I make no, no comment about it really, but there are more British-born people living in Australia than there are in the EU 27 which is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, and how does that work the other way around? Well, uh, more Australians visit the UK than anywhere else in the world in the course of a year. Um, still around a million, there are around a million Australian visitors um, to the UK every year. And I must say, anecdotally, as I travel around this country, everywhere I go in the UK, everywhere I go, there are people who tell me they have relatives in Australia. And of course in Australia there are so many people you come across um, who have the advantage of ancestry visas, for example, here because their parents or grandparents um, were born in the UK. Um, this is a bit of an issue in our parliament as well, but um, <laughs> those of you who are Australian, it's okay. It's okay, my ancestors moved to Australia in 1838. Uh, really am an Australian, I was a Member of Parliament, so all my decisions won't be null and void from now on. <laughs> the economic relationship with the UK, too, is actually still very substantial. Um, now, um, it, it's said that the UK, as it varies from year to year, but is around our seventh largest trading partner. Um, to put that into some perspective, though, our trade with the UK is just dwarfed by the trade we have with countries like China, um, Japan, the United States, Korea, um, even New Zealand, actually. Um, it's just dwarfed. Um, so uh, the UK is still our largest trading partner in the European Union, obviously be overtaken at the end of March 2019 by someone else. Um, but as you, as you understand, um, disproportionately a major trading partner of ours in Europe. Um, but, you know, our trade with Asia, particularly with North Asia and the United States, is an overwhelming component of our trade. 30% of Australia's trade is with China alone, with the People's Republic of China. If you add in Hong Kong and Taiwan, then it becomes a huge trading partner for us. Um, and the UK is, 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 of course, a very small percentage of that um, total figure. What is really important about the economic relationship between Australia and the UK is the investment relationship. So still to this day, after all I've talked about, the rather rocky period we went through with the UK, um, the UK is the second largest source of foreign investment in Australia. 
Um, and interestingly enough, for all that we have done in Southeast Asia and North Asia, um, and to some extent in South Asia as a country, uh, for all I've just said about where our major trading interests are, uh, the UK is the second largest destination for Australian offshore investment. There are huge Australian investments here in the United Kingdom, everything from um, Gatwick Airport, um, so um, no Australian investment in Heathrow Airport. Glad to see the government may be reconsidering its decision on Heathrow um, since the Australian taxpayer is a substantial owner of Gatwick Airport. So if they move to Gatwick, that'll be good for me as an Australian taxpayer. But um, uh, the, the airport's infrastructure more generally, in here uh, quite a lot of it is Australian owned. We have uh, retailers here in a very substantial way. Home base is now Australian owned. Uh, the Westfield shopping centres and so the list goes on. So um, there has been huge Australian investment here in the, in the UK over recent years and I think that is likely to um, continue. So the economic relationship is um, still a very strong component of our bilateral relationship. So if you just put those two things together, um, our people-to-people -people relationship and our economic relationship, then the relationship with the UK still really matters to us, despite all the things I've spoken about so far in this lecture. Now, when you think of the government-to-government -government relationship, I've often said, actually, the most important component of that, in, an, in a lot of respects, most important component of that is the relationship between our intelligence agencies. Our intelligence agencies are able to cooperate e with each other in areas like uh, counter-terrorism um, because there is such a degree of trust between our two countries. I think if there's one word that comes through when I think about the bilateral relationship, that's it, it's the word trust. Um, so government to government, we trust each other with our secrets. Um, we share our diplomatic cables with each other. Not all of them. We don't share with the Brits our diplomatic cables about Britain, of course. Um, but, um, and what we think about people here, not that they're too gossipy, um, to the regret of Canberra, no doubt. Um, but but, um, but the, the trust uh, um, is underpinned by the fact that we're able to do things like share intelligence, um, share cables, share assessments. Does that matter? Well, in what people in the media like to call the globalised world, it matters more and more. How many countries are there around the world, not that you collaborate with, because there are many, but that you can really trust? Well, this is one of those countries that I feel um, we can really trust. And this makes the government-to-government -government relationship very easy. Every year, um, and this began in 2006 uh, during a visit to Australia by Tony Blair. Um, we have the Australia-UK ministerial meeting, which was rather clumsily called AUKMIN. <coughs> it was called AUKMIN when I was the foreign minister, so I have only myself to blame. Um, but AUKMIN um, is always a very easy-going, relaxed and happy experience. Um, where you have two foreign ministers and two defence ministers, the British Foreign Secretary, the British Defence Secretary and their Australian counterparts meeting together for a day and a half, a convivial dinner, um, a full day of talks about issues of mutual interest and mutual importance, um, but a, the measure of agreement, the like of which you uh, would be very hard to find with any other country on earth. Why is that? Um, well, um, it goes to something one of, the, one of my predecessors as High Commissioner said here, somebody with great experience of Asia and the United Nations and other parts of the world, and so whatever you say about the relationship with Britain, there isn't a country in the world which is more like-minded with Australia than the UK. It sat in my mind, he told me this uh, some years ago now, and uh, it's sat in my mind ever since, and it's, it's completely right. This isn't... Um, a story of emotion, about an emotional relationship. It is just an intellectual point about how we think alike. And that might be a function of the people-to-people -people links, and surely is, 
a function of particularly Australia's evolving history, um, but, um, but nevertheless it's a very important component of the relationship. Um, all speeches um, everywhere I go in the United Kingdom are expected to include some reference to the sporting rivalry between Australia and the UK. Um, in a sense, I don't think that r rivalry is anything like it once was because uh, English teams in particular have just taken Australian coaches. Um, <laughs> and as you know, you for a very long time hired a lot of people from other countries to build up your teams. But um, when I see Eddie Jones sitting in front of me at the Australia uh, England rugby games, um, standing up and cheering whenever England scores a try, which is all too often, I'm afraid. Um, it's slightly galling. Um, the England cricket coach, he'll be back home, I suppose, in Sydney pretty soon. Um, he'll be back home in Sydney for a few weeks as the Ashes series is about to begin. And um, your coach, your uh, rugby league coach, um, is also an Australian, and so the list goes on. Um, that, that sporting rivalry, of course, is a function of the strong people-to-people -people links as well. It's not what um, causes those links to be strong. It's as a result of the huge migration that there has been to the Australian continent from the United Kingdom over many generations. So uh, that brings me finally to what next? Um, and the biggest event here in many a long time was back in June last year when the people of the United Kingdom decided to vote to leave the European Union. And uh, this was something that we took a great deal of interest in, as you can imagine, here at the High Commission. Um, and um, this was the view we had about it. We thought, um, we thought, I and mean, whether we're right or wrong about this, um, time will tell. Um, but we thought that it wouldn't have, either way, a huge impact on our economic interests. We thought it wouldn't have a huge impact on our security interests. I use the hu word huge a bit liberally. We didn't think it would have a very substantial impact on either our economic or our security interests, despite what the two sides of the debate were arguing, one saying it would be you know, crippling and the other side saying this was, there were going to be new sunny economic uplands for the United Kingdom and all of that. Um, our assessment was, um, if I could say so, more modest. We thought that the effect would not be all that great. Uh, we, however, came out and said we didn't support Britain leaving the European Union um, because of the impact it would have on the European Union. So we made the judgment that it was in our interest to have the most like-minded country that we know of, um, well, perhaps arguably with the exception of New Zealand, I should have mentioned that, um, the, um, for those New Zealanders in the room. Um, it's a fair point, I think. Um, but the, the most like-minded country we have in the world, uh, being a member of the European Union, meant that the sort of things that we believed in were being argued in the councils of Europe. Um, it meant um, that your commitment and our commitment to free trade, your standards of human rights, your understanding of the meaning of civil liberties, uh, your approach to political relationships, um, which you were arguing within the European Union, um, would reflect very much what we would have thought about those issues as well. So taking Britain out of the European Union for us um, will mean um, losing, if you like, that uh, point of view in the councils of Europe. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it will mean um, that the European Union itself will not be quite so transatlantic. It will not be quite as outward oriented as it was when Britain was a member of the European Union. Um, so we are much less judgmental about them. We were much less at that time, the last year, much less concerned about the economic issues than we were about that particular question. Um, but our view now is that the decision is made and we assume um, that uh, the, the passing of British membership in the European Union will 
um, go through and that Britain will leave the European Union formally at the end of March um, 2019, um, regardless of whether there's some transitional arrangement or other after that. Now, we don't um, get into all of the details of the negotiations between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Um, we offer no useful commentary on all of that, and I, I think it would be inappropriate for us to do that. Um, but, but nevertheless, we follow it, and we follow it with a keen interest. But when the referendum came, um, our Prime Minister rang me, um, and he made a couple of points. He said to me, um, you were wrong. You told me that um, the British would, or the UK, would vote to remain in the EU, and they didn't. Um, so I was thinking, yep, I just could be packing my bags and going home for getting that one wrong. At least I wasn't alone. Um, i had been proud to call the previous year's election for an outright win for the Conservatives, um, and I was becoming very self-confident in my political judgments until the Brexit vote, and then all my confidence fell away. Um, nothing that's happened since has helped to build it up again, if you understand what I mean. In any case, in any case, um, leave you did. And um, so the, uh, the second thing the Prime Minister said, what do you think um, our best positioning is now? Um, conscious, of course, as he was, that along with the likes of President Obama, he had said that Britain should remain in the European Union and the British public had studiously ignored him and perhaps President Obama. And I said, well, I mean, we need to secure our economic equities here. Um, and one of the things we should do is say that when the time is right, we would be prepared to negotiate a free trade agreement with the UK. And so um, he subsequently, when the time was appropriate, made that offer. Um, and the British government, um, under the newly minted Prime Minister, Theresa May, um, was quick to take up that offer. So since then, um, we, of course, recognise that the UK is still a member of the European Union and cannot, under EU law, negotiate trade agreements with third parties on its own. Um, but nevertheless, we have had some preliminary discussions through what we call a trade working group, and we've had three rounds of these preliminary discussions with the Department of International Trade um, ab about um, the trade policy that the UK will have once it leaves the EU, uh, Britain's positioning in the world in terms of international trade, the sort of role Britain could play in the World Trade Organization, and so the list goes on. So these have been uh, very preliminary talks and, sort, uh, and have been nothing akin to a negotiation with the UK. But as I say, we're not in a position to be able to do that, or more to the point, the UK is not in a position to be able to do that while it remains a member of the EU. Uh, people often ask me, do I think it would be easy for us to conclude a free trade agreement with the UK? And I say, well, we concluded a free trade agreement with the United States in 15 months. And we concluded it with the F United States in 15 months because we both sides knew exactly what we wanted out of this agreement. Um, to use a phrase, um, we knew that free trade meant free trade. So we carved very, very little out of the free trade paradigm in those negotiations. And the Americans carved out the sugar industry. There were some phasing arrangements and so on. Um, but we kept it, um, you know, given the nature of the United States, we kept it relatively simple. With the UK, <laughs> <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> um, it's um, 11, 12 years ago. Um, and, and just to tell you, it, it has been a huge success for Australia. Our trade with the United States since then has grown by around 77-0%. So it has had a very substantial impact on uh, at least our economy. But um, be that as it may, um, we say to the UK, if you are genuinely going to be a free trade country, and the British government's position is that it wants to be a flag bearer for the free trade cause in the WTO and in the international community, then in the first place that will be enormously welcome um, because to have the fit world's fifth biggest economy um, joining countries like Australia and New Zealand 
as flag bearers for free trade will be very helpful, um, and very helpful, if I may say so, at a quite difficult time for the free trade agenda in the world. Um, and it will also mean that the UK will be able to conclude free trade agreements quite easily because the British government won't be looking to carve out different sectors of the British economy um, from a free trade agreement. So the more the British position is it wants free trade without exemptions and too many phasings, or there have to be some of that, no doubt, um, and the like, um, the easier it will be for the British government to conclude a free trade agreement with Australia. And so we very much hope um, that uh, once the time is right and it's possible for Britain to negotiate these sorts of agreements, um, that we could negotiate such an agreement quite uh, quickly. We would like to see other parts of our um, relationship develop, some um, perhaps not so important, some more important. Um, there has always been the knotty issue of visas uh, for Australians wishing to come here. Uh, some of the arrangements aren't too bad. Um, you don't need a visa to come here as a tourist for a few months. Um, um, but um, access to work visas can be a complicated process. Um, if we have a free trade agreement, one of the consequences of that, I hope, will be the growth in trade between Australia and the UK. <coughs> it will be uh, more than that. Um, a stimula a, a, a give stimulation to the investment relationship and as Australian businesses invest here, sometimes they want to bring some of their executives over to participate in the market here, um, to help drive the business here. It's reciprocated, of course, with British investors in Australia, and we'd like that, uh, those sorts of arrangements to be made easier. We'd also like um, to build the relationship between Australian and British universities. Um, our university sector and the British university sector are very similar to each other. There are a large number of uh, vice chancellors of Australian universities who are British, and we're about to get another one, um, and they've all done very well, of course. And there are vice chancellors of British universities who are Australian, and there are quite a few of them, actually. So, um, and I think the um, president of King's College stands as a, a living example of this, although he might be a dual national, I fear. Um, <laughs> so he wouldn't be able to stand for the Australian Parliament, um, which would be a disappointment to many people. Um, but seriously, um, we would like to um, find ways of building that relationship uh, still further, perhaps having more formal arrangements for joint research projects, um, um, uh, looking for better exchange arrangements for academics, um, more opportunities for British students to spend time studying in Australia and Australian students studying over here in the UK. When our Prime Minister was here quite recently in July, um, uh, the President of King's College organised a very important round table for our Prime Minister right here at King's College um, to give the Prime Minister the opportunity to hear some of the ideas that are fermenting in the UK for building that relationship between Australian and British universities. So we very much uh, want to try to take that forward. So that brings me to the last point um, I want to make. And that um, relates to uh, still Brexit, you'll be pleased to hear, um, and how um, we feel about it in a, in a broader sense now that it looks as though it's going ahead. I mean, we're not I, I repeat what I've said, going to get into the nitty-gritty of any of the politics here and the different positions people have on Brexit and remaining and uh, what's happening in the parliament and within the government and so on. I think it's appropriate that we um, and the diplomatic community keep pretty much out of that. Um, and more than that, I don't think in the context of the negotiations between the UK and the EU, um, we should offer a running commentary about how we think those negotiations are going um, or um, uh, 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 how much Britain should be paying into the EU and all these sorts of things. They're matters for the EU and the UK to sort out. And, of course, this is a negotiation. So one observation I would make is that often people are saying, well, yes, but what is the British position or what is the EU position 
Uh, well, they might have a preferred position, both sides, uh, but who knows whether they'll be able to achieve their preferred positions within a negotiation. We will just have to wait and see. Um, and we will wait and see. Um, but here is a thought for us. Um, and it goes right back to where I began, talking about Sir Robert Menzies and geopolitical interests. Uh, we look at this Brexit issue uh, in many ways, and I've talked about them, but one of the ways we look at it is in terms of the geopolitics of the time. Uh, what, are, what, is the, what is the greatest single geopolitical issue of our era? That is the rise of China. Uh, we have the rise of China, which has been beneficial in many ways to Australia, but presents challenges as well. We've had the behaviour of Russia over recent years in Eastern Europe um, and beyond, um, which has caused substantial concern to the international community. Um, and we have from other parts of the world, not least in Asia, from North Korea, um, a huge challenge, a huge challenge to the rules-based international system and global order. So for us, what Australia wants is a strong Western world, in broadly defined Western world, very broadly defined, um, certainly including countries like New Zealand, Australia, um, Japan, so on. Um, a strong um, and decisive Western world which will stand up for the rules-based international system and reinforce the importance of upholding that rules-based international system. Um, and so from that point of view, in this era of changing power balances, we want to be sure that um, the countries that share our perspectives of the rules-based international system of world order and have our, the same commitment we have to global stability, uh, holding together as a broad, albeit loose, coalition. Um, so we want the NATO countries to hold together. Uh, we want those countries in our part of the world who are American allies to hold together, not just formal allies, but those countries which have close bonds with the United States and its security apparatus. Um, we want these countries to hold together. Um, and what has that got to do with Brexit? Well, what it has just one thing to do with Brexit, and that is that we have a high expectation that in the negotiations between the European Union and the United Kingdom, this overarching factor will be taken into account. It will not be in the interests of the Western world if those negotiations break down in acrimony. Uh, we won't be casting blame if it happens, except on all of the negotiators. Um, it is incumbent on the British negotiators, but it is incumbent on the EU negotiations, negotiators. It's incumbent on both the British and the EU negotiators to take these factors into account in those negotiations. Um, we're not interested in, well, we are interested, but we're not, we're not um, um, overwhelmed by the details of the negotiations, uh, but we do um, fervently believe that it is important that in concluding those negotiations, the relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom is one of harmony, um, mutual support, and still substantial interaction. And more than that, this does have some economic consequences as well. I've alluded to it already. This is a time <coughs> when the international trading system um, is facing a variety of challenges. Um, you know, I say it without blushing, we were disappointed um, that both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump went into the um, last American election campaign um, arguing that the United States should withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a partnership of 12 countries which had been ag agreed um, to promote free trade through the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, Donald Trump was the winner. Um, and he, he pulled the trigger and um, the United States left the TPP, as we call it, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, that is a setback for the Asia-Pacific region, of course, um, but it's a setback for the global trade agenda because global prosperity is, amongst other things, going to be driven 
um, by trade liberalisation, by open and competitive markets between countries. Um, and that is being more challenged now than it has been in recent years. Um, so in the context of the EU-UK negotiations, what we don't want to see is the erection of tariff barriers um, and even quotas and the like um, between the European Union and the United Kingdom. The EU internally, of course, it's externally uh, modestly protectionist in the area of agriculture is heavily protectionist. Um, but in, in terms of um, its internal arrangements, obviously it has a single market free trade. Um, we don't want to see free trade um, inhibited or restricted. We want to see it um, continue to be enhanced. With the EU, we're in the process of beginning um, negotiations on an Australia-EU free trade agreement. We hope to um, get those negotiations more formally underway soon. And, um, and get them concluded as soon as possible. Um, but we don't, in that environment, want to see tariff barriers erected across the English Channel and the North Sea. And we hope very much the negotiations will ensure that doesn't happen. Of course, that's not in Britain's interests. It's not in the European Union's interests. Um, but more than that, it's not in the global interest for those tariff barriers to be erected. So we have a message, not for the British alone, but for the British and the EU, um, that whatever their feelings, whatever the emotions may be about uh, the, the, the process of Brexit, it is very important to the outside world, which, by the way, is most of the world. It's most of the world which is not in the European Union. Um, it's just worth remembering that for just a... <laughs> just a moment living here, um, or in Brussels. Um, um, it, 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 is, it, is, it, is an import, it is important to us um, that this process happens as smoothly as possible with as little disruption. Um, and by that, I make no comment about the different models and so on that are put forward. Um, for us, um, they don't matter so much. What really matters is that the separation, I don't like the word divorce, it's a, a, a word that brings with it connotations of acrimony, um, but the separation um, is as amiable, as amicable as can possibly be done in the circumstances, whether people are in favour of it happening or whether people um, regret it. So um, this is a period where I think it's fair to say our relationship with the United Kingdom has been getting stronger. I don't think um, it's particularly true that it's getting stronger because of Brexit. It's getting stronger because people here in the United Kingdom have been thinking more globally um, than they've done for a very long time. Um, and perhaps the best way to finish this is by saying that, um, from my own experience as the Foreign Minister, um, and it goes back to the notion of trust that I referred to much earlier, um, in this world, um, you need all the friends you can possibly find. Um, and for Australia, the UK is a very natural and a very easy friend, a very lovable friend in so many ways. Um, and I think that is very much reciprocated. I have been very touched by the affection there is for Australia amongst the ordinary people of the United Kingdom, wherever I go. There is huge enthusiasm and, and affection for Australia, um, and that is, um, if I may say so, very much appreciated. So yes, we went through some troubled times um, through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s in our bilateral relationship, um, but I think now we have reached a point where this relationship is getting back to the natural strength that it really deserves. Thank you very much.